Even as we make the tear, even as we acknowledge our grief, we say words of belief and of affirmation in God. And so if you would repeat after me, Baruch, Baruch, Asa, Asa, Adonai, Adonai, Elohim, Elohim, Melech, Melech, Ha'od, Ha'olam, Dayan, Dayan, Ha'emet, Ha'emet, Blessed are you, Blessed are you, ruling spirit of the universe. Friends, uh, just a word before we before we begin. Um, it's a warm day right now. The sun is not out, but should it come out, and should anyone feel in any way uncomfortable, do not hesitate. Remove yourselves. Come under the tent. Sit on a gravestone. It's not sacrilegious. We are here for a sacred purpose. Just be, be careful. And there is water in this cooler here. Don't. Hesitate, please, please. We gather this afternoon to remember the life of one who filled our world with her love, her goodness, her extraordinary spirit, and her example. In humility and gratitude, we turn to the wisdom of our tradition for comfort, for guidance, and for understanding. Throughout the centuries, whenever our people felt lost, confused, adrift, they would turn to the words of Psalms, a favorite of Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the mountains. What is the source of my help? My help comes from Adonai, maker of heaven and of earth. Es ein El Herim Mein Mein Yahweh's Re Es ein El Herim Mein Mein Yahweh's Re 
I deny what are we, that you have regard for us. What are we that you are mindful of us? We are like a breath. Our days are like a passing shadow. We come and go like grass, which in the morning shoots up renewed, and in the evening fades and withers. You cause us to turn to dust, saying, Return, O mortal creatures. Would that we were wise, that we understood whither we are going. For when we die, we carry nothing away. Our glory does not accompany us. Mark the wholehearted, and behold the up. They shall have peace. When I die, remember me with a smile and laughter. If thoughts of me provoke no love, only sadness and tears, I ask that I be soon forgotten. Give what's left of me away to children and old ones who wait to die. And if you must cry, cry for your brother or sister who walks in grief beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give to me. You can love me most by letting love live within the circle of your arms, embracing the frightened ones. Love doesn't die. People do. So when all that's left of me is love, Give me away. It is a fearful thing to love what death can touch. A fearful thing to love, hope, dream, to be. To be and oh, to lose a thing for fools this and a holy thing, a holy thing to love. For your life has lived in me, your laugh once lifted me, your word was gift to me. To remember this brings painful joy. Tis a human thing, love, a holy thing, to love what death has taught. Dear Kathy and Dan, dear Betsy, Linda, David and Christina, dear grandchildren, family, friends. Judy Collin was a character, a bona fide, unmistakable, unique, authentic, irrepressible, genuine character. She was always and ever Judy. Loving, caring, smart, stubborn, opinionated, passionate about music, reading, and the royals, about cards, travel, and the opera. She was friendliness personified to the chagrin of some of her loved ones, open, outgoing, refreshingly forthright, and eminently memorable. We knew what she thought. We knew where we stood with her. We knew who she was, because she could be no one else. She was honest, straightforward, and candid. She had no pretensions and put on no airs, with the possible exception of believing that she was a member of the British royal family, <laughs> mistakenly left in a basket on the doorstep of Charles and Sylvia Redley. In fact, it is not beyond the realm of possibility <laughs> that Judy and Queen Elizabeth note the name Elizabeth after whom Betsy was named, Kathy was named Kathleen instead of Catherine, only because her birthday is March 17th. It's still part of the realm. At any rate, it is not beyond the, the realm of possibility that Judy and Queen Elizabeth shared a distant Hungarian ancestor. <laughs> As the Queen's great-great-grandmother was a countess born in Transylvania. Judy's Hungarian grandmother, Anna, was actually born in London. 
as her parents were making their way to the United States, where Anna's daughter, Sylvia, was eventually born. The result of all this migration was that Judy, Linda, and David had a grandmother with an English accent, whereas most of their friends were fam excuse me, most of their friends were familiar with Eastern European cadences. In fact, as a little girl, Anna dressed all in black to stand outside as Queen Victoria's funeral cortege went by. Judy arrived, doorstep or not, on May 10th, 1939 the firstborn of Charles and Sylvia's three children. As Linda arrived five years later and David six years after that, as the siblings were spread out over 11 years, their childhood experiences were quite different from each other. Whereas Judy grew up in University Heights and graduated from Heights High, the family had moved to Shaker by the time Linda and David were grade schoolers and became high school graduates of Shaker. Another consequence of the siblings' age difference was that Judy served in something of a nurturing and caretaking role for Linda and David. She and Linda eventually became very close as sisters and as friends. David distinctly remembers that Judy, that Judy taught him how to read when he was four years old. All three share a love of reading and constantly exchanged book titles personal reviews and insights, with David and Judy especially focused on nonfiction possibilities. David will be forever grateful that just within the last weeks, he managed to download onto Judy's ancient Kindle, Tina Brown's newest book, The Palace Papers, Inside the House of Windsor, The Truth and the Turmoil. I'm not sure if that is nonfiction or fiction. <laughs> Judy's passions mostly developed early on in her life and remained constant throughout her life. As a child, she studied piano at the Cleveland Institute of Music and vividly remembered her mother taking her and Linda to hear the Metropolitan Opera every year when it would come to Cleveland for a week on tour. The last sounds she may have heard on Monday were most likely the opera playing in her room as Dan and Kathy thoughtfully put it on to ease her final hours. Throughout her school years, and in fact throughout her life, she had a gift for friendship. She made friends in high school that she kept her whole life. Just weeks ago, she made lifelong friends at the hospital. She made an extraordinary impression on people, all people, in every walk of life. She made no distinction, distinctions. She was as interested in the cashier, or the nurse, or the housekeeper, as she was in the owner, the doctor, or the conductor of the orchestra. And she was memorable. Linda would walk down 57th Street and the doorman of her previous building would ask about her sister. <laughs> when she came home from the hospital, among the gifts she received was a bouquet of flowers from the hus housekeeper on her hospital floor. I felt it myself. I remember feeling an immediate connection to her because of her openness and honesty, her unwillingness to dissemble or to pretend. She was strong-minded and strong-willed, and that was clear in a way that was refreshing, sometimes exasperating, I would imagine, and even fun. As Betsy indicated, she was informed and did not hesitate to share what she knew about a subject, an issue, or an item. And so we asked her because her opinion was helpful. We relied on her candor and her intrepid approach to all subjects. Interestingly, the subject of school was uncharacteristically vague in her case. After Heights High, she went off to Ohio University where, it seems, she was not entirely happy. After one year, she transferred to Ohio State, where she was introduced to a somewhat older pharmacy student as a potential bridge player, bridge partner, excuse me. They quickly discovered a shared love of music and were well on their way to falling in love when he finished his pharmacy training and went off to fulfill his military service 
as an ROTC graduate. Judy came home to Cleveland when he took off and eventually graduated from Case Western Reserve University. The kicker in all of her transfers was that every time she moved from one university to another, the new school would not accept her gym credits. So Judy, who, according to Kathy, hated physical activity with a fiery passion, had to do physical education two times more than necessary had she remained at OU. She took bowling each time to fulfill the requirement and claimed she had bowled a perfect 300. She eventually earned a master's degree at John Carroll University in indeterminate subject, according to the family, but we assume it was in the realm of education. Judy was a natural, gifted teacher who began her career at a very young age at the Boulevard Elementary School in Shaker Heights, where remarkably, she had students who were Brother David's age and with whom he became friendly when they all ended up in the Shaker Middle and High Schools. David's grade school had been at Mercer. That quite wonderful part of this dynamic was the opportunity it afforded David to hear how beloved his sister was by her former students, whose tributes were spontaneously offered. She loved to take her students to the orchestra's key concerts, and we can imagine the lifelong love of music she may have inspired in many of them. She certainly inspired and influenced her own children and was inordinately proud of both of them. Given their father's pharmaceutical work, Judy was not surprised by Kathy's interest in this in the sciences, and Dan, Dan's similar expertise. She avidly followed Kathy's career as a chemist and her inventions of new products at Eastman Kodak and Sherwin-Williams. Given her own gifted teaching, she was exceedingly proud of Betsy's career in teaching and of her recent return as a parateacher, a substitute, and her work as a special needs kindergarten inclusionary teacher she also knew that Betsy will pursue a master's degree in the study of autism. Judy's pride in her children went beyond their contributions, skills, and expertise as accomplished professionals. She was cognizant as well of their gifts as parents. When Bert was alive, they traveled often to Seattle to visit Betsy and Brian, Rachel and Josh. Judy did not impress easily but she noticed Betsy's prodigious skills as a parent when her children were growing up, and Betsy stayed home to nurture, guide, and support them. For her part, Betsy wanted to be sure that her children knew their grandmother and made sure to bring her children to Cleveland to visit. Rachel particularly developed a close and enduring bond with her nana that was special for them both. It was easier for Kathy and Dr. Dan as they were the children on the ground. They had the advantage of proximity and easy access as they could gather frequently with Dan's parents, Shelley and Nan, for dinner or a birthday or a holiday observance. Kathy had the opportunity to enjoy Great Lakes theater productions and outdoor concerts by music stars in the classics with her mother. She also had, the many, had many opportunities to share day-to-day -day events, questions, conversations that sustained them both and Tom fell under her Nana's spell as Judy connected with her as only Judy could. There were times when Kathy and Dan would ask Judy what was going on in Tom's life because it was the only way they could find out. <laughs> Judy was as comfortable with the four-year-old on the floor as she was with the strangers sitting at the next table in a restaurant whose meals she might ask to taste if something looked <laughs> interesting. To every passenger on the cruise ship she and Bert so greatly enjoyed, every one of her, whom Bert would relate was fighting to sit next to her before the gangplank went up. She was a wizard of relationships. She had a special magic that drew people to her and caused them to remember her. She touched our hearts and lifted our spirits. She was the most caring person in Linda's life. When Linda returned to New York City after the death of her beloved husband, David, she found that Judy had flown to New York and taken up residence 
at the Phillips Club near Linda's apartment. At first, Linda thought she had come to the city for a wedding and the party that followed. But Judy was very clear that she did not want Linda to come back to her empty apartment alone. When Bert began to decline, Judy was indefatigable in her care for him as she helped him maintain as much of his life as possible. And when that was no longer feasible, she searched for the proper facility for him, greatly helped and supported by Betsy and Kathy. She loved to laugh and did so easily often at the instigation of Betsy, who also shared her sharp wit and unabashed forthright manner. Or she might as easily laugh at herself as when the whole family traveled to France, David and Christina with Charles and Madeline, who have since added Alan and Eric to the family, Linda and David with Sarah and Seth, who now have Sylvie and Sydney, as well as Judy and Bert with Kathy and Dan and Tom, Betsy and Brian with Rachel, whose Trevor is here today, and Josh. Judy noticed that in every small town at which they stopped, there was at least one store window with a sign that read P-A-I-N, pain, in it. Judy was taken aback by what she perceived as a great deal of suffering in the country <laughs> until she was reminded that P-A-I-N in French spells pain or bread. So there was bread for sale in those places. She laughed and laughed for the rest of the trip. As she did when she won at Maj, Judy was something of a card shark, who only played for money and discussed often with Dan whether she could afford her losses, which were accumulated in pennies. As David pointed out, as social and outgoing as she was, there was a part of her that, for, that preferred to be at home reading a good book. She was 18 and a sorority sister of his bridge partner, whose father vainly hoped that they might sail into a duplicate bridge future. When the bridge partner determined that she was not romantically interested in him, she fixed him up on his way to meet his blind date for the first time. He became hopelessly lost. When he finally found a phone to call, she promised to stand in the middle of the street so that he couldn't possibly miss her. Once he found her, neither Bert nor Judy was ever lost again. For 52 years, they enjoyed a very special relationship as they were true partners, lovers, companions, friends. They had interests, values, and viewpoints in common. They were remarkably in sync and in tune with each other. Judy was always grateful for the life Bert made, Bert made possible for her, and together they created a life of family, faith, even if, even if it was just this side of Anglican, and great fun. They loved to laugh and did so frequently with the joy of each other. When Kathy married Dan and when Betsy found her Brian, Bert and Judy rejoiced in the growth of their family and could not have been happier than when Rachel, Joshua, and Tom came into this world and into their hearts. He was the one and only great love of her life. They became business partners as well as Judy helped run the pharmacy and even maintained the store for a time after Bert's passing. They loved to travel and traveled the world, often to destinations that had just opened up and before others discovered them. They traveled to China in 1983. They were in Brazil in 1978 during the great blizzard of that winter that was so bad they saw Cleveland under snow on Brazilian TV. <laughs> they traveled to Europe did a, and did a month long driving tour of France from inn to inn that Judy planned herself. They visited Hong Kong, Australia, Hawaii, and, I'm sorry, and, and ultimately, I'm sorry, uh, I can't read it. Um, oh, excuse me, that's why I couldn't. <laughs> um, Hawaii, and wherever they went, they visited cemeteries. 
multiple in multiple locations, including Prague and Westminster Abbey. They found them fascinating places. They did not wait until they were at an older stage of life to travel. As soon as they had enough money to do so, they took off for exotic destinations. They saw opera at some of the greatest opera houses of the world. They loved the art and the culture, the food and the people, always the people, wherever they went. And when they were traveling, they spent many winters in Naples, happily enjoying the warmth and each other. After the years of anguish dealing with Bert's declining health, Judy was grateful for the years of health and strength that she enjoyed, years in which she could participate in and attend activities in Tom's life, such as a lolly the trolley ride to visit the sukkah at my house, years in which Rachel met her Trevor and Josh was accepted into the North American Hockey League training program for referees, years in which grew her friendship and dependence upon Glenda Eduardos, who was with her to the end. Years in which she maintained her remarkably organized, planful, and in charge manner of dealing with most of life's issues, including the end. She always seemed to know what she wanted, even the structure of this day. She had a copy of Fairmont Temple's Guide to Death and Bereavement waiting in a folder with Kathy's name on it. We never expected the end to come as fast, but she knew. She had decided what she was willing to endure and what she would not. It was all very clear in her mind. Betsy saw it and supported her. The whole family had planned to come in yesterday to say goodbye. In her kind and generous and organized way. Perhaps she understood that she could save everyone from the need to make a second trip. She was unique. She was quintessentially Judy. She was a character. Zichonali Bracha. May the memory of her laughter, her spunk, her indomitable spirit. Her gift for touching others, her mind, and her music be always for blessing. And let us say, Amen. God, you give us loved ones, and make them the strength of our life, the light of our eyes. They depart and leave us bereft on a lonely way, but you are the living fountain from which our healing flows. To you the stricken look for comfort, and the sorrow laden for consolation. O oh God, we see life as through windows that open on eternity. We see that love endures and the soul endures, as you, O oh God, endure forever. We see that the years are more than grass that withers, more than flowers that fade. They weave a timeless pattern in a world that is the dwelling place of your love and glory. Please rise.
spirit of the universe. Grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence to Judith Kahn, who has entered eternity. O God of mercy, let her find refuge in your eternal presence, and let her soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is her inheritance. May she rest in peace, and let us say, Amen. The dust returns to the earth as it the spirit returns to God who gave it. It is only the house of the spirit which we now lay within the earth. The spirit itself cannot die. Receive in mercy, O God, the soul of our departed, Judith Collin. Grant her that everlasting peace which you have prepared for us in the world to come. Though no human eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor mind has grasped it, still it is our sure inheritance and our everlasting portion. O oh God, help us to understand that grief and love go hand in hand, that the pain which loss inflicts is the measure of a love stronger than death, that we cry in the anguish of our hearts. May we be like children who know that their parent is near and who cling unafraid to the trusted hand. In this spirit, O oh God, do we commit all that is precious to us, to your keeping, as we repeat now, words hallowed by generations of our people, as we call Kathleen forward, to help to lead us in the Kaddish praise. of the tradition of our people to help to bury our departed with our very own hands and for those for whom it would have meaning to place a symbolic shovel full of dirt upon the gravesite. I invite you to do so at this time. We'll ask the family to begin and then those who wish may also participate. And as the, as the family performs this mitzvah, I invite you to look at the pins that many of them are wearing. These are all from Judy's special collection.
this part of our service with these words from our tradition. Lech kishilach ha'adunai. Go your way, for God has called you. Lech v'adunai yiyeh imach. Go your way, and may God be with you. The halach l'fanecha tikecha kavod adunai yasvecha. May your righteousness go before you, and the glory of God receive you. And we say to the family, Hamakom yinachem etchem. Betok sh'ar avi leitziyon v'yerushalayim. May God console you with all who mourn in Zion and Jerusalem. Anyone who still wishes to put uh, uh, dirt upon the grave, you, you may certainly do so. But this concludes our service. And